Welcome to the McClary discussion group where um, we're going to talk, I guess, McClary for a little while and we'll have some questions and answers for, from all of you. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, State Representative Paul Harris out of Vancouver, Washington. Um, serve the 17th district. Uh, tends to be an interesting district. I had uh, a Democrat seatmate for years. Uh, barely have a Republican seatmate who won by about 125 votes. It's a swing district. Very cognizant of my votes. I had the opportunity of serving on the Educational Funding Task Force, one of the eight that was locked in the room for the extra two months. It was a lot of fun. Um, spent a lot of time on McClary, um, but I am relatively new to the committee, so I'm the ranking member. Good morning. I'm Reuven Carlisle. I'm a state senator from the 36th district, which is northwest Seattle. I've been a member of the Senate for two years and uh, been on the Ways and Means Committee. And prior to that, I served in the House for seven years, in which I was very active in the uh, funding side of the educational journey. And I think all of us can appreciate um, the magnitude of this uh, stage th that we are, f that we find ourselves in as the court moves into the final aspect of this program. So I think all of us know that uh, we're at a pretty important juncture and look forward to the conversation. And I am Jamie Lund. <coughs> I have been an education policy analyst for about a dozen years and I spent about six years in the legislature doing that for the Republican caucus. For the last six years I'm a ed policy analyst for the Freedom Foundation, essentially a taxpayer advocate looking for accountability for the tax money and wanting to get the most effective use of those dollars and so that's kind of the perspective that I'm bringing. I'm Julie Salvi. I am a compensation lobbyist for the Washington Education Association. Um, I have a history of working on state budgets over um, many years, um, starting when the lawsuit had been filed and then have moved into a lobbying role since then, continuing to work on ed funding. Sure, we can talk about where we are on McCleary right now. The, so the Supreme Court just recently weighed in. Um, they liked a lot, in fact, they liked a lot that we did uh, on the Educational Funding Task Force. What they didn't like was that they felt like we didn't start the process early enough, that they would like us to put a billion more dollars in and relatively fast. So um, it put to bed a lot of things, but I've, I've got to be honest with you. I have I've wrote down the list of districts that I have visited during the interim. I have been to Bellevue, Everett, Issaquah, Lake Stevens, Lake Washington, Mercer Island, Tahoma, Vancouver Battleground, Evergreen, Washougal, and I attended the small school conference uh, on this issue. This issue has not left my life yet. Um, it, and, this, and I was relatively surprised at the Supreme Court uh, decided that they would like to stay involved in that. That was one of the things in the Educational Funding Task Force when we met. We really didn't think that they would want to hang on to this, but they proved us wrong and they, they have decided to hang on. So I think, I don't know if that, in, in my mind, I'm sure the group might have differences on, on that, but what I heard the Supreme Court say was everything except they didn't like it was fast enough. So I would step back for a brief moment and just remind us that that McCleary is really the symbolic representation of a 30-year journey of court cases, uh, from the case in which they determined that it is the paramount duty of the state of Washington at the state level to amply fund education all the way through uh, the operationalization of that uh, in the actual McCleary order. So it's really that 30-year journey. So I think when the court has said um, that the September 2018 deadline is real, it's authentic, it's the central driver of their decision a few years ago uh, in their main ruling uh, is not a surprise. And I think we have to acknowledge on a really substantive policy level uh, that the court has been consistent. They have not wavered in their central framework. We have a strong constitutional framework in our language of paramount duty. That is unusual by other states. We have the strongest state language in the nation. So what are the implications of that? It means that we have a top-down uh, top uh, funded policy-based system from Olympia. I think that's the interesting conversation as we move into this next stage is how do we meet the letter of the law but also the spirit of what that means? So I think some of the issues on the table aren't just 
Uh, do we meet the technical mechanics of what the uh, amply funding public education means? We have to do that. But we also have to ask some very important questions about what's the spirit of what a state-driven system looks like. I personally have some deep uh, and, and uh, serious reservations about the direction that we're going with this very strong top-down state-centric system. I think that's a legitimate policy and philosophical question to put on the table. And I think ultimately uh, in setting the framework for meeting the letter of the law, we have to ask ourselves what kind of system do we want in the decades to come. So the letter of the law is important, but the spirit of the law is an important part of the conversation. 85% plus of funding a public education in this state is, uh, is teachers and your workforce and your ability to recruit and retain a great workforce is the central obligation of every single organization, whether you're Amazon and Microsoft or whether you're public education. And so I think that we need to look at some of those deep systems issues and uh, to begin to get serious about not just the next few months of this particular order, but the, the broader issue itself. So the senator is saying nice things about the Supreme Court, so I'll go ahead and say some nice things about the legislature since we're gonna do a Freaky Friday thing here. Um, I really do believe the legislature has done a <coughs> phenomenal job of providing resources for education. It is way astonishing how much they've done. By the end of the process, it will be a doubling of the state funding of education in less than 10 years, which if you would have asked me coming out of the basic education finance task force, you know, hey, are, you think they'll be able to do this? I'm like, no, they're gonna fake their way into doing, you know, an extra billion or two here, but to literally double it is truly an astonishing accomplishment. Their, uh, <clears throat> their work on transportation funding, getting that totally done, it was one of the very clear areas where you could say, look, diesel costs this much, transporting kids is an obligation, the state is pretending like diesel costs less than that, you need to fix that. Really clear and easy part of it. But there were some more difficult things that they took on as well. The, the, the material supplies and operating costs, 135% increase in those resources. It went from $546 per student to one, uh, in the time of the McCleary decision to $1,264 next year. That's a 131% increase in materials and supplies money. And that and other things are truly astonishing. The salary compensation differences, which will be realized, uh, we anticipate, are, are again astonishing. We're talking about a 39% increase in teacher salary as a result of the decisions that are being made. We would not have believed that was even possible, and yet it, it did happen. So there have been important things on the resource side, but to me even more astonishing is what they did on the equity side. Coming out of this decision and saying, all right, things like grandfathered salary differences, grandfathered different levy lids, uh, the disparities that exist between property rich and property poor areas, are those issues that the legislature is actually gonna be able to tackle? Again, I would have bet against it, and yet coming out of this, they seem to have made a legitimate effort to really restore that balance, to make sure that the taxing burden is shared more equally across, that the resources per student are shared more equally across the state of Washington. And that required goring quite a few oxes that maybe didn't, didn't like that, and yet it was the right thing to do if equity is a virtue that we want to produce, and if the paramount duty is equal for all students across the state of Washington. So hands down, the legislature has done an amazing job on those issues of equity and of resource provision. Now we'll talk maybe later about things that we have problems with, but uh, just for now, that is truly something, and we can't forget that. Everybody's gonna find the next piece that they're unhappy with, the next bit of the solution that isn't quite right, but let's not forget what has been done is truly astonishing, and compared to 10 years ago, this is a giant leap forward in the provision of resources, but we wanna make sure that it results in better services for students, and we'll talk about that down the line. So um, I had prepared my comments today um, reflecting on some of the title of, you know, have we, we may have addressed McCleary, but have we fixed education and, and looking forward in terms of what's next. And first, I do also want to recognize the very big steps that the legislature has taken. They have put, in, put a great deal of new resources in uh, for public education over the last few years. But I also want us to view that in the historical context. Um, that is after 30 years of really no big changes um, in the funding structure. 
Um, Jamie was talking about the big increases in maintenance supplies and operating costs. So if we think back to the late 70s when those kind of formulas were first made, there really wasn't technology in schools, not anywhere near like what we have seen today. And But along the way, the legislature hadn't really gone back and revisited to say, are, are the costs that we're putting out there for those material supplies and operating costs matching what districts are having to spend? So when you see some of these big leaps, it's because it has been delayed and then there is a big step. We still need to recognize and applaud the progress that they have made because it is difficult to make those big leaps. Um, also putting it in comparison, um, when we look at the, our state and local funding combined in K through 12, we have been below average. If you adjust for regional cost of differences among other states, we're even farther below average. So while this is a big leap and there's a lot of progress for Washington here, we're kind of striving for average. It may put us back in the middle of the pack. It is not something that's shooting us well above and beyond um, other states. So that is why you will continue to hear parents and educators and school boards and others talk about this is great, but there are still needs in our system. Um, a few that came to mind, special education, districts are still putting in a sizable amount of their local dollars in to address the special education needs in their schools. There was some progress made in this um, fix, but it is, it is not enough to close that <coughs> gap and fully address it. Um, transportation, there's been a lot more money going into transportation, but over the last few years, there's also been a lot of feedback from districts that even that change hasn't completely matched up when you think about some of our districts that have to drive around a peninsula or through a mountain pass or some other way that makes them unusual or they're stuck in urban traffic. That might be another cost driver. <clears throat> so um, those are areas that you will, will continue to hear about from school boards and um, parents and educators. And from parents and educators, I continue to hear about the need for additional class size reductions. The legislature has made progress in K through three, but beyond that, our students are still stuck in some of the most crowded classrooms in the country. And that is something that is important to parents for their own children and um, for educators who really want to give that individualized attention um, to all the students who they are serving and who they are passionate about. Um, but it's not just about class size either. There are other elements of the funding formula where there are gaps. In nursing, for example, Seattle has allocated nine nurses to serve the 50,000 students of Seattle. But they hire 61. And that is um, not quite as diverse across the state. It's about double. Districts hire about double the nurses of what they are allocated. And it's not just nurses. The, in the um, school safety area, the state allocates 189 FT statewide. We have 295 districts, by the way, so that's less than one per district, but yet districts are hiring 560. So while we have made great strides, there are still conversations to be had because districts are delivering the individualized education at, to the standards that their parents and their communities expect and that their students deserve. Um, and the last point I would make is that compensation will still be a key part of this conversation, and I'm not saying that just because I'm a compensation analyst, but I think there were some unintended consequences of how the legislature made changes that may need to be addressed. Um, this, they dramatically changed how they are allocating salaries for certificate instructional staff. The state has had a grid before that recognized if a district had more senior staff or more highly educated staff, the state would adjust that the salary allocation so that they could hire the same number of staff, essentially, is how that worked. Um, there was a push to change that, and I think equity was a large part of that conversation. So now the state is, is allocating on an average. But as districts grapple with this, and as the legislature created a salary grid work group to look at a model salary grid that districts could look for, as we grapple with that, we find, not unexpectedly, that the average doesn't go as far in certain districts. If you have more senior staff, more highly educated staff, depending on where your staff fall out, your, your average dollars will not go as far. And so we can look at some districts in Southwest Washington where if you put them on the same grid, uh, neighboring districts would have a $9,000 salary difference, but yet they're receiving the same dollar amount from the state. So those salary dollars will not go as far in some of those districts. Uh, in addition, the regionalization to recognize um, high housing costs in some of the areas of our state probably creates some unintended consequences. 
Um, the poster child for this is North Mason, um, which is over in Mason County and is drivable to the Kitsap Peninsula. Um, they don't have any regionalization based on their housing costs. The Kitsap Peninsula um, has 18%. And so North Mason is bordering a district that receives 18% higher salary allocations from the state. And there was a lot, there were a lot of moving pieces in this final compromise. And it came out really without an opportunity for public input, for districts to look at it, the time was short, it passed. What I view this upcoming session to be is some of that public comment happening. And what I expect you to see is some reconsideration or refining of those policies to address some of those um, unintended consequences that I don't think, um, you know, I don't think legislators intended to disadvantage certain districts over others. It just, as you start to look at the numbers, you see um, some of those issues happening. And then, um, Competitive compensation will continue to be an issue with the minimum salary set at $40,000. That's under uh, where the compensation technical work group recommended in 2012, that salaries be at 48,000. If you adjust for inflation, that'd be 54,000 by the time this is implemented. Um, and we're seeing declines in teacher prep programs and booming retirements of among the baby boomers. And so we, I think we will continue to have a structural teacher shortage unless and until we can truly target, t truly tackle the uh, market competitive wages. So I thought that I would uh, tee up sort of a, a couple of issues, uh, and I, Julie touched on a few of them, but I think that first of all, we all know that the legislature uh, will grapple with all aspects of education forever, and it's central to everything we do. And the key word is refining. There's no question that there's a whole bunch of unintended consequences. But I think that if we step back, there are a handful of incredibly important systems issues on the table that we do need to continue to look at at that systemic level and really thoughtfully approach from a policy level. Um, the letter of the law around McCleary is one thing. As I said, the spirit of the law, I think, is something else. So first, how do we integrate operating and capital budgets? How do we have facilities and buildings? Every single school in my legislative district is packed with kids in portables, every school. What does that mean for quality of education? What are the issues there? Two, how do we look at a systems level at integrating education from early learning through higher education? We have such a silos of the institutional bureaucracies, a silos of how the money flows, a silos from Olympia down to the local levy, w local whether it is uh, early learning, K-12, or higher education. We have to have the courage to acknowledge the implications of that and to begin to tackle how real people, uh, students follow through their lives to have the kind of high quality outcomes that we seek. Three. Let's find a way to talk about linking uh, everything that we do in terms of education, in terms of high quality outcomes. Our high school graduation rate is inching up. We've made some meaningful progress, but I don't think anyone believes that it is acceptable. We have to move toward an outcome-based system, and we have to do that collaboratively. We have to do that first and foremost with teachers on the front lines who have a deep understanding of how to make wraparound services and integrated services work. And I think we need to partner with, uh, with a lot of best practices around the country to make that happen. Four, for me, it's tax policy. We have to look at how the state money flows and with the local, how the local money flows. If we pull back the role of local levies, we pull back the role of local communities in connecting to their local schools. And I think there's a great disservice that we do. People want to feel a connection to their local school, and if they don't feel that connection via taxes, it, they get more and more removed. Local levies are important, and this idea that we're going to get them down to nothing and they're not going to play a role, I think, is, is, uh, is unsettling at best. Um, four, uh, the, I mean, f five. I was say five. Five. The, the central role of uh, uh, of how the state defines basic education is, in effect, as we know, an entitlement. The fear 
of investing in wraparound services, the fear and in investing in putting other services in education is that they become an entitlement that therefore will be funded forever at any level re regardless of efficacy. We need to connect the role of outcomes, the role of policies in a way that's not fear-based. So for example, I had the amendment on the House floor in 2009 that added um, highly capable as a definition uh, uh, included in the definition of basic education. I'm incredibly proud of that. I think all kids deserve appropriate level of, of, uh, uh, of education to match their, their needs. The fact of the matter is that we shouldn't treat examples like that as a political decision of what gets in and what gets out. So our definition is constrained by our fear of making something an entitlement. And I think we need to have more flexibility in that area. It is especially critical in the central idea of the 80-20 rule, of those policies and programs like wraparound services, like integrated services that go to the core of our ability to make the incredibly important uh, progress on, um, on disparity and the, the racial dynamics and the economic dynamics in our schools has to be on the table, not just in theory, but in reality. And we know that high quality wraparound services, tutoring and mentoring works from early learning through higher education. And we have to embrace that as opposed to be afraid that that's gonna turn into an entitlement. So those are some of the systems issues that I think that we will continue to refine as we deal with the tactical issues in this session coming forward. It, for years to come, we will be, continue to tackle these issues. And I think ultimately, um, a stronger sense of uh, openness to some of those deeper systems issues is, is the central driver of our ability to be successful. So according to our schedule, we've gone over time and we were supposed to, we were supposed to leave you a half hour for questions and <coughs> we've only left you about less than 20 minutes. So first off, I wanna see if there are any questions. Dang it, there are. <laughs> Good. Yes, John. Uh, John. Starting off with Representative with uh, Senator Carlisle, and then I'm going to ask the other three of you to respond to whatever he says. <laughs> uh, what is the what What is the Democrat game plan for dealing with coming up with one billion dollars in the upcoming session? Uh, so the question was, what are we going to do this particular session with the 950 some million dollars that is the current gap of what the court says? So I, I think that's a that's the central question on the table, of course. But there is not a simple answer. Everyone has uh, uh, differences of opinion regarding the depth and breadth of what we can accomplish this session. There is a genuine and a firm resolve to do all we can to meet the letter of the law. At the same time, there's a recognition that the one-time funding obligation uh, needs to be matched against the long-term implications. So basically, what's the long-term sustainability? So the additional uh, $1 billion, I think you'll have a general consensus that a combination of sources, a combination of um, strategies and options. I'll give you one example. Uh, the role of local levies is really important. The, set rate of $1.50 per thousand of assessed value, and then the maximum amount of $2,500 per student, which is the financial construct that, was, that came up with last year. That is totally subjective. That $1.50 per thousand assessed value for the state amount of funding, and the $2,500 that a local levy can raise is an arbitrary, subjective number. So if we if we uh, played with the pacing of that and the timing of that. So in 2018, there's a very substantial property tax increase coming statewide. The districts in 2019 that will have a reduction in taxes have a delay. So the, there's a lot of opportunity for adjusting dates on all sides for local levies as well as state dollars. So I think that that's a legitimate question. So for example, just tactically and technically, you could raise the amount of the $2,500 that $1.50 assessed value raises per student, and uh, you would have local levies in areas have the ability to raise more money. So um, in effect, there's property tax 
tax-related components of it. Then you have just the question of new money. We do have a reserve, as folks know. Um, this in immediate uh, letter of the law relative to that 950 plus million is, is a one-time uh, additional component, so there is the ability to use part of the reserve for that. And then there's just the question of, is there a reconfiguration of our existing funding that needs to be made? Is there a reallocation? It's a short budget year. Do we have to shift resources from existing programs? Every single one of those strategies on, is on the table. Um, I think as a general statement, you will see uh, a over general consensus that we need to meet the letter of the law, and we're going to try to find a way to do that. So I think you have two or three major strategies in terms of adjusting the key configurations that we've already done. You have the ability to use some of the reserve money. You have re redesign of our existing spending in the budget. And of course, you have the opportunity for new, new revenues. And I think all of those are uh, at a legitimate level of policy discussion, and I, I know that there's been no determination made. It struck me that you, you talked about, I forget the number that you said, but it was something to me that in the number of roughly a billion in two unique local levels, and there's some public authority, we might get local levies. Is that what you're saying? No, lo local levies, I mean, local governments and local levies play a critical role in funding public public education. The, the obligation of the state is to fund basic education as defined by as, as the paramount duty. There's no retreat from that. We're committed to that. Uh, there's a lot of improvements that we need to make to that special education. Julie mentioned is the most obvious one. Uh, there's districts that are spending substantial amounts of money. But there's nothing in the ruling that says that we cannot modify and adjust the local levy rates. And that configuration is uh, on the table just as much as new revenues might be on the table or any other factor. There's no uh, set policy that says that the exact level rate levels that have been set are here for to set in stone for the rest of, of uh, life. So those are very much a term of art. So I would completely disagree with that. Um, I have met the McCleary. De, uh, I have met my McCleary decision when I made this. The, the court said we need to come up with a plan. I came up with a plan. I think it fully. Uh, it's interesting that we've gone now from fully funding education. I'm listening very carefully now that the new word is we need to amply do education. Well, I want you to know. I think I've met. I've, I've met the court case. But I want to talk briefly about the local levies. To me, it's very important that we understand what the McCleary decision said that we cannot take levy dollars and put them into basic education. And I believe that that billion dollars is basic education. And I am not going to start a McClary II here. So we've been very clear on what we've done. Uh, we have met our obligation. And I think it's a weird paradigm that the court put us in. To raise a billion dollars in our state fast is not an easy thing to do. I'm not going to raid the rainy day fund. Um, so there's only a couple ways I can come up with a billion dollars, and I don't like any of them, to be honest with you. Uh, the easiest one would be to increase the sales tax. And I would, rec I would highly recommend all of my Democrats to do that. I think we need to not do a thing. We have met our McClary obligation. Oh, they're going to fine me $100,000 a day. I'm going to put it in a separate account, and I'm going to give it to education. Absolutely. But isn't that just saying? That's saying I. I'm not saying screw the Supreme Court. I just sat down and spent years meeting this obligation. I've spent a ton of time. Don't tell me I said screw the Supreme Court. I spent two months out of my life, an additional two months up here, sitting up here, away from my job where I could have made more money. Listen, I spent a lot of time on this. I spent a lot of thought on this. And no, I believe we have met the McCleary uh, obligation. They might disagree. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, they said it was a matter of timing. I Then I, I would ask them, since they seem to be the smartest people in the room, tell me where they're going to come up with a billion dollars from our people. We've come up with $5.3 billion, an additional $2 billion before that. We have doubled down on education. It is our paramount duty. We will continue to fund it, and we will do a great job of it. I'll be 
brief this time. Um, so I will just, since you asked us all to respond, I, we will support the um, <coughs> Senator Carleo's and the Democrats' position of finding a way to fund the, the obligation. And I'm going to go off on the, the property tax piece of it because that's important to me as, a, as an advocate for local control. I'm also on a school board, so I am a little sensitive to that notion. Part of the big solution here, part of the, the elegance of this solution is that the legislature was obligated to find a way to decrease the reliance on local levies. Now, I'm as jealous a, an advocate for local control as you'll find, and I believe that local levies are very, very important because you do want to own your own local schools. You want to put your own distinct uh, flavor onto it, and you want to have it meet the needs of your local community. But as the problem has developed over the years where levy money is con increasingly rolling into compensation because of what's happening at the bargaining table with compensation, you know, deem done days or try or whatever you want to call it, as well as on the health benefit side, that has been eroding the discretionary funds that local school districts have for many years. There are districts now that spend 40% of their levy on salary enhancement. So the glorious solution that we get now is the legislature saying, look, we're going to bump salaries up by 39%. We're going to do regional cost of living adjustment, which I'm a little uncomfortable with because, wait a minute, my teachers aren't worth as much as your teachers because I'm in a, in a different kind of an area. But okay, I understand what's going on here. We are trading a smaller bargaining table and lower local property taxes for the state shouldering this responsibility and getting local school boards out of the business of negotiating enhanced salaries and out of the business of negotiating enhanced health benefits over and above what the state provides. And I'm going to be very concerned if part of the solution on this is to somehow reload those responsibilities back onto us as a local school district and that will be what will bring this issue around much, much sooner. Within a decade or two, we will again look at, oh my goodness, levies are funding salaries. What, are, what, a, what a proof of inadequate funding have we discovered here? And now we're gonna have another McCleary. And in fact, this is what happened before. The reason we have a prohibition on negotiating salary, which has a loophole that we're driving trucks through, is because after the Duran decision originally, this was the core problem. How do we keep the union from capturing local discretionary money as pay increases as they overpower school boards in their local communities with the politics and the marketing and all the rest that goes on there? So the legislature has in fact solved that issue if we can preserve it. So if the solution is to unwind some of that, I'm gonna be very disconcerted about it because we should have got local property tax relief rather than ongoing increases in local levy authority whenever the legislature doesn't feel like funding uh, education to the extent that it wants to. And we've seen that go hand in hand. We're gonna lower teacher salaries and administrator salaries and we're gonna give you another 2.5% uh, levy authority, wink, wink. What does that mean? That means at the bargaining table you lost all of that money. And so let's not go there again. And that's going to be one of the most important things of this legislative session is to protect the, the shrunken bargaining table so that we don't have to negotiate salaries or, comp or health benefits at the local level. With that, let's have other questions in the, in the back. So the question was, is there an opportunity to substitute the increase in the state portion of the property tax with another revenue source? Um, so I will answer that, but just take one quick moment of personal privilege. I really want, regardless of politics and positions, I want everyone to know that uh, Representative Harris and, and the other folks who sat on the task force that went through hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of hours, it really was a, a genuine sacrifice, and, and, the, and the passion and the spirit behind that is absolutely appreciated by the people of the state. Um, I, in terms of the question, I, I think that's uh, very uh, spot on that there is a very substantial 
a concern about the dramatic increase on, uh, on the property taxes in terms of the impact on the middle class. The way the construct of the property tax increase was designed is overwhelmingly hits the Puget Sound area. Um, the dollar fifty per thousand of assessed value increase, I mean, a flat amount that uh, we're moving toward, is about an eighty-two cent uh, per thousand increase statewide. This was absolutely emphatically demanded by uh, the Senate Republican uh, leadership, and this was their number one priority. Of course, was to raise property taxes in order to fund this source, and we needed to come up with a funding source, and that was the, the, the source that they felt strongly about. Uh, the Democratic side, as a general statement, felt that there were more progressive sources, that there could have been a more balanced approach, a more modest property tax with a combination of something more progressive, closing some tax uh, preferences, exemptions, and credits, along with some discussion about a uh, capital gains tax above $50,000 uh, a modest 5% flat rate per uh, 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 capital gains tax. So there's still discussions about that that are very serious. There is a strong contingent of folks who would argue that we do have the support uh, this year to move in that direction. I think that's a term of art. I think it's in divided government, where, which we are. It's incredibly difficult to predict whether that's viable. Uh, I think the impact of the uh, middle class property tax increase that is coming that was demanded by uh, the Republicans is um, is uh, going to be felt statewide in February when those uh, property tax bills hit. And so you might have a change of heart regarding uh, an increasing desire for more progressive sources of revenue. Uh, there is a contingent in the House, I would say, that is uh, considering uh, capital gains as an option. Uh, there are other options on the table, uh, but I think that it's, uh, it's a coin toss to say whether or not there would actually be a reduction. Uh, you could, for example, use the real estate excise uh, proposal uh, that would be a progressive real estate tax on the sale of a property of above a million dollars, which would allow it to be lowered about 10, 15 cents, for example, and at least make a meaningful difference on three million parcel owners statewide. So there's some strong desire to do it, but very tough lift just logistically in a short session. And I just want to challenge one notion that, that <coughs> The property rich areas, which are Seattle is currently paying a, a buck twenty per thousand to generate resources, and, and oh no, you're going to add eighty cents, and that's going to make people not pass their levies. There are rural poor communities like Aberdeen that have four dollars per thousand or even higher that are passing those levies to meet the needs of the kids in their area. And so it seems unlikely to me that that progressive Seattle is somehow going to feel like the children aren't worth an extra 80 cents or whatever the difference ends up being on that. And I'd also challenge the notion that property taxes are not actually progressive because the bulk, the reason that you can get away with a buck 20 per thousand is the amount of commercial property. That is taxing industry and commercial property, whereas rural areas simply don't have that. Those are all homeowners that are stepping up. So. I, I think that it is a progressive solution, and I think that it does address the equity issues, and it does actually put the responsibility on the state the way that we have solved the issue currently. And that was one of the issues in the force. We actually, in the task force, we looked at that. We have rural areas that literally are paying four to 425 uh, per thousand, and it actually, we felt it was an equitable way to tax. Ad additional questions? Michael. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So, um, my question is, and it's just two real quick. Um, did you think that there's a, a correlation between the drive for us to fund a property to fund our education and the, the rise and the increase of the, the opi opiation and the other drug addictions um, throughout the younger population? And do you think that there's a consistent result for that? So, so, the question is, is there a linkage between the long term? Uh, time that is taken to fully fund education and the recent rise or increase in opioid and other substance abuse uh, issues that have surfaced statewide. Is that a fair representation? And I think both Representative Harris and I have a particular interest in this area, so I appreciate the question. Yeah, so I, I sit on the health care committee, uh, have since, since day one. I, you know, I don't know that there's a correlation and, and Ruben might disagree, I, I honestly don't know. I, I know we have an opiate epidemic, and I know we have a problem. I've never actually related it to that, so you've kind of got me thinking maybe differently, but I, I have never thought of it that way. But 
Uh, I would have equated it more towards um, in looking at education-wise of maybe some of the requirements we requ require of students today. Uh, I think there's a lot of stress in, in school of passing tests. Uh, I'm one that believes in delinking of tests from graduation. So I, I, I think I'm kind of old school. I went through a school myself where if I passed the, my end of class tests and I did okay and if I was gonna go to college, I took an ACT and SAT and if I did well on that, I, I, would, I would go on. Um, I think we way overthink uh, some of the testing. So I would actually more gravitate towards maybe opiate abuse in high schools as maybe two pressures put on in school, but I've never equated it to funding. So I'll have to think about that. Um, but the opiate crisis is, uh, strikes me very near my, my, my actually my sister uh, was a teacher who died from basically from opiate abuse and uh, had prescriptions in several states, um, uh, Utah, Idaho, uh, Oregon, Washington, um, Utah. So um, I'm not sure that I can equate it to, to where you're going but uh, I do know that there is a crisis and I'll be happy to, to work on that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, I think the, the central issue is that um, we as a society are feeling an incredible sense of disconnect in our lives. And I think there's an emotional and a spiritual and an educational and an employment component to it all. And I think you're touching on something very profound. Uh, and the fact is that in many, uh, not just the rural areas, of course, where it's so pervasive, but also in the city and the homeless issue in Seattle and King County is just shocking at a level beyond imagination. The nexus and the linkage between the quality of our education, the sense of connection that people feel to uh, a caring, engaged adult in their lives is, is central to, people's to young people's quality of life. And I think that the linkage with behavioral health, mental health services in our in our society, as well as education and wraparound services. There's that deep, holistic approach. That's how real people living real lives live. And I think that we've disconnected ourselves and retreated into the silos of different, uh, uh, of different issues. And I think that's the systems issue of our day. So thanks for raising that. Yeah. You know, I, I could ask an assessor question. I could ask the entire <laughs> Complete, complete, uh, oh, the, the question is about the bill breakfast after the bell and how we kind of stood on it. So Rep. Harris voted no several times, have changed, so the last, so I've been a legislator for seven years. First two years I was no, I, once again, it just shows how imperfect I am. I have switched my vote uh, the last couple times and have voted yes for that. Um, believe that it is something that, um, I think if it will help students, well, you know, I, you know, and, and it's interesting, you know, when you you change your votes, people go, ah, I go, well, you know, I think as I've matured sometimes, and as we look at different things, uh, life is not always the same. Mine always hasn't been the same. So I am a proponent of that bill. Uh, we'll vote again for that. Hopefully, if it comes back, uh, I've got to work on some of my other people on in the Republican side who probably are not keen on that. <laughs> Um, actually, you raise one of the issues that I think is the most critical, and it's one of the, the lost issues of this whole discussion. We focus on how many dollars increase, we focus on how much people get paid, we focus on all of this stuff. But to me, the real important piece of education is the service. You don't actually get education results from money, you get education results from services. And if feeding, if addressing mental health needs, if addressing other things are part of what you need to do, that's great. So we've seen a 60% increase so far in education spending. It's going to 100% by the time it's all said and done. How many days of school are there? Still the same number. How many employees per student? Pretty much the same number. In lower grades, there are some things that are different. Full day kindergarten, that's a different and a new service level increase. But if you break out what was done in terms of what services changed, we had a bunch of money for English language learners, one of my, one of my passionate issues. 
what changes for the life of an English language learner as a result of, of $1,000 coming to my district for that? They still have the same number of minutes of school as anybody else. Occasionally, we pull them out and put them into a smaller class and give them a class with a teacher, which they would have gotten anyway, but it's a slightly smaller class size. So what service did they actually get? Now, are we going to offer after school? Are we going to offer summer school? Are we going to do supplemental learning opportunities? There were a number of these things where we saw a lot of money go in, but not a lot changing. We have an increase of students of 6%, but we have an increase of employees that averages about 20%. What's happening for those students as a result of a 20% increase in employees? Is the service changing? And unless we're focusing on the services, you're not going to see results change. And we haven't. We still have essentially the same third grade reading rate that we had before. We have essentially the same seventh grade math rate, minimum proficient rate, as we did before. We have essentially the same dropout rate that we did before. So focusing on money is not the answer. Focusing on whether districts the, the partners that we have in delivering education are actually adding services to students is where we need to do. And I'm not seeing a lot of that happen. That would be one of my big disappointments in how this has happened. Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Oh, I wanted to um, go back to the question on the breakfast after the bell. We do find that to be a very um, helpful service for students. And I would um, counter a bit of what Jamie said in terms of we have seen things that are getting more individualized attention to students as we are lowering class sizes, we're having more money for LAP in the highest poverty schools. And so um, these things may take some time because the money is just now coming in um, for many of those changes. But we do expect to see student-focused uh, interventions coming. So with that, why don't we take one minute each super quick and do a final wrap. I would just say uh, thank you very much. I think we all recognize that we're facing one of the most extraordinary uh, opportunities and times as we move into the next generation in a, in a post-McCleary era of uh, funding education and, and uh, hopefully getting the kind of outcomes that we all want to see. So appreciate your passion and your spirit behind the issue. Let's just remember we want to do what's best for kids. That's truly what it's all about. Uh, just, just three things. I mean, in the upcoming legislative session, there's really three things that I feel like are going to be real important. We need to hold, the legislature needs to hold the line on everybody coming in to get their last bit of, of their last pound of flesh, their last special interest uh, grab out of the deal. The rich regions are going to want to go back to a system of disproportionality that we had before. The union is going to want to return to a system where they can whipsaw local districts against the state on salary increases. And, and a host of single issue folks are going to want to say, you kind of didn't hit it right. We need just a few more dollars per and trying to preserve the whole system rather than letting it all get, get swamped by these interests is going to be the key of this legislative session. I hope they're able to thread that needle. Um, so in a 60-day session, I feel like most of the conversation is going to be around technical implementation fixes that uh, time will be short, it will be fairly focused. Um, my takeaway, as I had been thinking about all the comments I had to share with you today, is that as the court continues to state both in the Dorn decision and in the McCleary decisions that basic ed isn't set in stone. It's the obligation of the state to continually revisit and keep it up to date. I feel like as we are focusing on the last part of compliance with this McCleary decision, it's not the end of the story, it's not the end of the road, it is the next chapter. And if we want to take a lesson from history, if we don't want to be back in this situation of having a giant catch-up step, we need to continually review what we are doing and how we are funding the schools for our, the students in our state so that we can keep up over time. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day.